Thanks for tuning in to Truthout TV for another week. This is the video series that highlights writers who contribute to Truthout.org. I'm your host, Ted Asfragadu, and with me today is Laura Flander. She is the host and creator of Grit TV. She's also a contributor to Truthout, and we're going to talk about the state of our union. Hi, Laura. Thanks so much for being on Truthout TV. Glad to be with you. So um, I've been reading a lot of your work, and there's a common theme that appears in the writings that I've read, at least your recent writings, and that is economic security for what has been called the 99%. My question is, why do you think this theme of economic security, reducing economic inequality, doesn't resonate too much with the American public? Or as I remember Bill Maher once saying on his show, that the reason why it doesn't resonate is because there's so many people out there that think that that's kind of white noise. And you know what? They think I'm going to make it to the 1% one day. Well, you know, I don't know if you're really right. I mean, Truth Out was one of the places that covered the entire Occupy movement that showed a tremendous interest in this question of uh, in, in economic inequality. I think that we actually saw an election where people got a sense of inequality when it came to the effort of the right to suppress the vote and people showed up to try to take back their right to vote. So I, I'm, I'm not buying it that people um, are not uh, resonating with this notion of, of inequality. I think though that you're right that America isn't a country that believes that everything should be shared equally. It is, however, a country that has been committed forever to um, challenging the entrenchment of power. And I think that what we're seeing really resonate in this country right now is the sense that people don't have the breaks that they've been promised by, you know, American ideology, the chance to get out of where they are to somewhere else. So do they believe in, you know, equality? Somebody said to me today, um, you know, if we divided up the resources of, the, of this country, everybody would get $200,000. You know, sounds pretty good. Yeah. You get 100000 and work half as long. Uh, that's not the sort of equality that I think Americans are ever going to buy into. But will they buy into the sense of, Wait a minute, in 30 years, our wages haven't really risen. We have 400 families that are essentially owning the wealth of 180 million of the rest of us. Is it right that I can work for 10 years at the same factory and start at a wage of $5 an hour and end at a wage of 10? Be sent home with a ice cream cake, as a member of my family was recently. Um, no, I, and I think what you're seeing in the streets is people saying, um, that's not right. My access to a break, to a fair chance to make something of a future, and my kids' access to that kind of fair chance um, is part of our ideology. It's part of our expectation. Uh, we're not going to let that go without a fight. No, I, I, I think what I was getting at was those that voted for Mitt Romney, and I can't speak for everyone that voted for Mitt Romney because certainly I don't know them, but I think that when he gave that speech that really just said, you know, there is a whole group of people out there that are a nation of takers. And I think that that kind of resonated with a good chunk of the voting population. Certainly a majority of the people that voted in this last election uh, voted in a way that would promote more economic equality and lessen okay. that gap. So um, and that's, that's what I was speaking to. And I think that when you and Bill Maher brings up something like, well, you know, I'm going to give you in that one percent. I think he was speaking to the people that kind of identified with what Mitt Romney was saying during yeah, the election. Hey, listen to yourself. I mean, here you have an election that showed that actually, um, given, you know, in imperfect options, people did vote for the candidate who was um, speaking up for a, a fair break for everybody. People did vote for the right to vote even when their voting rights were being challenged. People did show up in an election that people said, you're never going to get the kind of turnout you did four years ago. You got a bigger turnout this season. So I'm just questioning your premise. It didn't resonate. It seems to me the other guy's argument didn't resonate. Um, this idea that we actually do have a commitment to one another in a society beyond dog eat dog, uh, that is the one that lost last November. Perhaps I listened to too much talk radio. Maybe that's <laughs> part of my problem. Um, but it, it does get to something else that you, you had brought up in your writing, which was, and this gets to our nation politically, socially, that there is, there's some real divisions here. And, and you had even uh, commented that the divide in this country, both politically and even socially in many ways, is as bad as it was during the Civil War. 
Yeah, you've got a lot of divisions, and I thought about it in the light of the president giving his State of the Union address. You know, in this predominantly middle and working class country, you've got a Congress that's almost entirely millionaires and billionaires. And there was a study not so long ago by a professor at Duke who pointed out that today's congressmen, on average, will have worked no more than 1.5% of their entire work life doing any kind of manual labor. So any kind of taste of working class life, the life of 90 million people in this country, the majority of our workforce is entirely foreign to the people that we call our representative government. They're not very representative. So in that way, we've got a divided nation nation. Geographically, we're divided too. Uh, much as we want to say, as Barack Obama did back then at the DNC, that we don't have a red and blue country, we have one America. We don't. We have a country that is divided north versus south when it comes to the Electoral College in a way that's very reminiscent, barely changed since Civil War years. Um, and I, I think that's something to be concerned about. What do Democrats just write off um, uh, the South? Do progressives decide, well, this is as good as it's ever going to get, being a Democrat? I think we're in a period of real um, dissatisfaction with the way things are, a, a desire for change, more change than we're going to get in this administration. Um, and uh, there are some real tensions that I think we have to address head on. You speak of war, and, and uh, one of the wars that is winding down is the war in Afghanistan. It was announced uh, as of this recording that 34,000 troops should be home within a year's time. Within that story, uh, there was a uh, another story that was, was in the Los Angeles Times and in the San Francisco Chronicle and many other papers, and it was about the shooter, the one that, uh, that ultimately killed Osama bin Laden and his personal life after, after this mission. His marriage ended. He's had thoughts of suicide. He can't seem to hold a job. As this war winds down, as soldiers come back and transition into civilian life, there's certainly going to be uh, psychological issues that they're going to have to deal with. But the reality is the jobs just aren't there for a lot of returning soldiers, just like there aren't a lot of jobs for Americans, American civilians who are out there uh, looking every day. No, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot in what you just said. One thing I think that we don't want to fall into this notion of the war is winding down. The war may be winding down as far as U.S. participation. The U.S. presence is shrinking, although not going away. Um, but the war for people in Afghanistan continues, and I think that we have to maintain vigilant attention to the fact that we are leaving an increasingly militarized society, a society where women are even further than they were from having equal rights, where there is a, a poverty level that is leading one in five kids not even to get to their first birthday, one in 11 women to die in childbirth, at the same time as this country, the United States has been spending $2 billion a week um, on having U.S. troops in, in Afghanistan. So before we talk about winding down, let's just remember who it's winding down for and who it's not. In terms of the troops coming home, you're absolutely right. You've got an economy in this country now that is abandoning the very people president after president has committed to keep a place for, to keep a job for, um, uh, to keep their lives intact. And I think the populations that have been hardest hit, sadly, since the economic crisis of 2008 have been uh, populations of color, women, and returning veterans. And that just speaks to, you know, a world of crisis in our system that even those populations that have very high standing in the public eye, um, most of them were, let's not forget, drafted for poverty reasons in the first place. It was the only job they could get. They come back. The jobs are still not there. What are we going to do about it? Well, when I was in high school, and that was a long time ago, my high school was a fertile recruiting ground for the military. So I was actively recruited to get into the Air Force, the Army, and the Marines. Most of my graduating class, either they had two choices. They could either go into the military or they could find a job at, say, um, a, you know, like a Target or a Walmart type, type type department store, because most of the factory jobs had pretty much ended in in where I grew up, and um, so many of my friends went into the military because that was the only option. So yes, it does it does hit you know lower to middle income folks without the wherewithal because the jobs just aren't there in, in yeah, terms of, of to, that you can sustain a family, you know, gives a whole new meaning to volunteer army, right? Right. Right. 
You know, one of the things I also was thinking about was the terms of, of big money and the influence of big money in politics. Now, this has been a topic that has been going on for years, if not decades. Big money buys big lobbying firms who then in turn bend the ear of politicians. But who speaks for the 99%? Who in your orbit, and because you, you're a political watcher, an analyst, uh, somebody who's very much engaged in the in the process, and I'm sure you know lots of organizations that do a lot of good work on behalf of, of middle income folks, of lower class or lower income folks, the 99%. Who are they? And are they making any headway in, in, in Washington, D.C.? Well, I think you have a mixed picture. I mean, look at the last election. Um, on one demographic, women, for example, you saw a big increase in uh, women's representation in the Senate. Now, the question is who represents those people if their representatives aren't doing that job? Uh, and, and it's a good one. I mean, I think there are some organizations that are making a big difference. Before we get to them, I think it's important to acknowledge that the major countervailing power in America historically, which was trade unions, um, are at a historic low in membership. So the one entity that existed from, you know, Civil War times through FDR uh, to put any kind of check on corporate power has been successfully really decimated both legally, ideologically, kind of culturally um, by the opinion makers in this country. And it's been a concerted campaign. Oh, yeah. Uh, you just look at what happened in Wisconsin and some of the other states in the Middle West. So what's left? I mean, you have community organizations, powerful grassroots leadership. You have some interesting new coalitions, sticking with women workers for a minute, that coalition called Caring Across Generations that brings together those who are needing care in the home and who are giving care in the home. This is a huge and growing population as the baby boomers retire. We have somebody in America retiring, I think it's every six minutes. Uh, this is a population of workers and of people needing those jobs done for them um, that is booming and exploding. And guess what? It's some of the least protected, least well protected uh, work in the, in the country. Um, workers that were explicitly carved out of the Fair Labor Standards Act that was passed in the 1930s when it was thought that people working in the home were just nannies or grandma. Um, that's an interesting coalition because if you like it's sort of bringing the employer and the employee together there are grassroots groups like the National Domestic Workers Alliance along with unions, the SCIU, the FLCIO and others um, to try to have an impact both locally at the a state and city level passing bills of rights for domestic workers at the international level where they got a, a international bill of rights passed at the International Labor Organization two years ago, ILO, um, and nationally where there's been a big push to expand the protections offered by the Fair Labor Standards Act and although a whole lot of people wished it had been, a whole lot of people wished it had happened sooner, um, it does look like that could come to pass, the law could actually um, be uh, signed in as short as 60 days, I think, from now. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's an example of kind of creative organizing, bottom-up organizing with help from traditional labor, but not entirely uh, dependent on traditional labor that I think is an interesting model. And then the other thing is, you know, we've been talking a lot about the economy. And I'm uh, encouraged by the economic innovation that's happening around the country as people figure out how to set up worker cooperatives, um, uh, worker self-directed enterprises, uh, new ways of keeping each other employed, keeping the community needs met, uh, sharing uh, resources, sharing tasks, sharing, you know, meeting one another's needs. That, I think, we'll find is a real path of change for the future. I don't think it's going to come in the same old ways, but it could come in some of the new ones uh, with people actually developing industries and employment models in their community that can challenge some of the old ways of doing things and be embedded in an investment in not just profits, but in people and in sustainable towns and communities around the country. So as you look out in this nature of ours and you uh, had to assess the state of our union, what would you say it is at this point? I mean, well, I think you have to say it's rotten. The state of our union is pretty damn rotten. I mean, on the one hand, yes, we had um, more people able to vote than we were afraid were going to be able to vote last November with the, you know, 
massive amount of corporate money and anonymous money poured into a campaign uh, of the the Republican candidate. The Democrat managed to beat him hands down. Enormous effort to suppress the vote, particularly of Democratic African American voters defeated by activism at a local level. Um, and at the same time, so that's all exciting, maybe our democracy is relatively strong, but at the same time nobody who's not a millionaire can afford to run for office. You've got a political divide that reflects an entrenchment of certain kinds of power in different parts of the states. It's still impossible for somebody to really run on an independent ticket and um, not be discouraged by their fellow um, candidates. The Democratic Party pulled out every stop to uh, hamper the chances of anyone from the Green Party uh, getting elected anywhere um, around the states, although they weren't entirely successful. Um, you know, the state of our union is troubled economically, as we've described, with a gap between rich and poor unlike anything we've seen. So the state of our union, I would say, is uh, mixed and needs a lot of help from us. Okay, it went from rotten to mixed. So that's actually progress right there. Laura, I want to thank you so much for being on Truth Out TV and uh, talking to me about the state of our union. You're welcome. My thanks to Laura Flanders for being my guest on Truth Out TV. And that is Truth Out TV for another week. I'm your host, Ted Asfragati. We'll see you next time. <laughs>